Welcome to Economics for Dummies. Our goal today is to inform everyone who is watching about current economic, social, and political issues. Because how are you supposed to make decisions and have valid opinions on social problems if you aren't even properly informed? We have a lot to show you today, everywhere from gas prices to legalizing marijuana to minimum wage. To start off, a pretty big problem in today's society is climate change and how to address the issue. Two recent suggested solutions are a cap and trade program and a carbon tax. To start off with the carbon tax, Caitlin, Ben, and Frankie will be introducing it, explaining what it is, and discussing uh, the meanings of an, of an implementation of a carbon tax. Okay. What is a carbon tax? A carbon tax is putting a price on carbon and it works by having a person pay a specific amount for each amount of carbon that he or she releases into the atmosphere. An important aspect of the carbon tax is the carbon footprint, which is the total amount of greenhouse gases produced to directly and indirectly support human activities. Based on this, the correct amount of money added to the cost of production of different products can be determined. Therefore, the higher the carbon footprint, the higher the cost. Currently, items that are based on carbon intensive materials or manufacturing processes that are, are priced in such a way that they don't represent the cost on the environment of producing these products. Therefore, the main idea behind a carbon tax is to make it clear to people that these products contribute carbon dioxide emissions and that their contribution should be accounted for in their price. For example, the low cost of gasoline doesn't nearly cover the cost of transporting it, the effects it has on global warming, and the fighting over its resources between different countries. So if the price is raised, people will start to be more conscious of how much of these products they use and the resources behind them. The hope is that this will change their behavior. This hope is also applied to companies in the following sense. If companies see that people are not buying as much of their products because they had to raise the price due to their carbon dioxide emissions, then they'll try to become cleaner and greener so that they can lower their emissions and therefore lower their prices. This will hopefully return customers to the company. A carbon tax would affect nearly almost every aspect of life since everything either gives off carbon dioxide or is made in a factory that emits carbon dioxide. So the effect on our everyday lives would be big at first. However, as places become greener, the costs will decrease and eventually return to normal levels. The profit generated from the tax would be put to use to buy, by funding green technologies such as solar energy and wind turbines. A perfect example of this is Colorado. Colorado implemented a very successful carbon tax where the profit they generated was used to install different wind turbines all over Colorado. For more information on a carbon tax, here's Frankie. The imposition of a carbon tax might hurt the wallets of citizens right now, but the long-term effects are much more prominent, those being a huge reduction in the pollution of our atmosphere and a large amount of money that will fund our mission of creating a renewable and clean form of energy. Many people argue against this because the money they spend will not pay itself back in the near future due to the difficult task of creating this renewable energy. Although one might not notice the extremely positive impacts that the carbon tax will bring, the significantly positive outcome will slow the pollution <coughs> of the atmosphere enough to buy us more time to spend researching clean renewable energy. The general population that opposes this proposition complains that there just aren't enough energy sources on this earth that can support our needs when we reduce the production of gasoline and oil. Companies that produce solar power, wind energy, and water turbines are being looked at to see if our needs truly cannot be satisfied if a tax on carbon emissions is implemented. Right now, many of our tax dollars are funding these forms of energy. We will soon find success in this research, and when that happens, we will no longer spend all these tax dollars from the implementation of the carbon tax on the research and can put them to good use perfecting renewable and clean energy to the point where we will no longer need to burn fossil fuels and pollute the atmosphere. The carbon tax is not a new concept. It has been tested in several different countries and provinces, one of them being within the United States and Boulder, Colorado. Uh, they implemented it in 2007, and they started the tax at $7 per ton of pollutant. Um, the t they s estimated the tax would uh, cost the average household about $1.33 more per month and that would help generate about $1 million in annual revenue. 
Uh, the revenues went to part of their climate action plan, which is a plan to produce renewable energy. And in 2009, the city council actually voted unanimous, unanimously to raise the tax by five or six dollars, increasing the revenue by 800,000 annually. And the tax uh, stopped in 2012 because it was just like a trial run and they wanted to see how it would work. Um, a country that tried, another country that tried um, the carbon tax in 2012 was Australia. And they set the price at $19.60 per ton. Um, the highly polluted energy um, had fell 14% in the first nine months after the tax was implemented, and renewable energy um, generation rose by 28%. Um, the portion of the revenue from the tax went to renewable energy project, and over half of it went to supporting low and middle income family households with the rise in price of energy. Um, it was said that three million homes um, were hurt by the tax because they were paying more than they were getting back in taxes. Um, two million homes were no worse off, so they basically stayed the same. And four million homes were actually benefited by the carbon tax because they were coming out ahead of the tax rate. Um, people hated it because when the government implemented it, they told them that they would pay about $13 more a month. But in reality, the, that price was actually doubled. So people weren't very happy. And in 2014, it was repealed. So they no longer have a carbon tax. And uh, outstanding carbon tax today is in British Columbia, Canada. Um, it's the only jurisdiction in North America to have a carbon tax at this point. Um, their price is $25 per ton, and revenues are being returned to taxpayers through income tax and business income tax. Um, the taxpayers have actually come out ahead, and because of that, British Columbia has the lowest um, personal income tax in Canada. Um, consumption of fuel has dropped by 16%, and within that same time period, Canada's um, consumption of fuel has risen 3%, so the tax had a huge effect within British Columbia. Um, it wasn't very popular at first because it does cost people money in short term, but as time has went on, um, people have grown to see that it actually is benefiting them. And they imp what they did differently than most um, places that have implemented the carbon tax is that they have done it in phases. So they started off with the tax being $10 per ton, then they raised it to 15 the next year, then 20 the next year, and slowly, gradually it went up. And as it went up, more less and less um, fuel and pollut pollutant was being generated. So they actually were benefited more and more by it, and the government was getting more revenue and being able to put it back into the economy. So now it's time for the alternative solution uh, to our climate change crisis, which is a cap and trade program. Now, Peter and George will be giving examples of how the cap and trade program works, how it would be implemented, and examples of where it is already used. We are here to discuss about the cap and trade system. It is one of the main economic solutions, aside from a carbon tax, that could curb the effects of climate change. The goal of the system is to lower emissions by limiting the amount of pollution pollutants produced and released into the atmosphere, and also by giving companies and industries incentives to turn towards innovation for alternative energies. There are two aspects of a cap and trade system, the cap and the trade. The government will set a limit upon all the companies in the country who produce emissions of greenhouse gases. Each company will only have a specific amount of a certain pollutant, which it can produce per year. That's the cap. There simply cannot be more than that much pollution. If the limit is exceeded by any company, that company will then be fined. The second part is the trade. The government distributes allowances or credits to companies who produce those pollutants. Ideally, the companies would be given credits for fewer emissions than their current level. So they would either have to reduce their emissions or buy more credits from other companies. If a company can lower their 
emissions easily. They would have credits left over which they can sell to other companies for profit who are having a hard time. Basically, the government creates an artificial trading market in pollution. There are two ways the government can go about distributing allowances. The first option is grandfathering, where companies receive credits based on how much greenhouse gases they already produce. This type of distribution is problematic, since it would not reduce the amount of pollution with a big amount initially. And the biggest polluters will receive more credits than companies who pollute less, which seems counterintuitive. Also, if companies anticipate the initiation of a cap-and-trade system, they would simply pr increase their production beforehand in order to get more credits in the future. The second option is allowing is auctioning the allowances, where companies who need more credits pay more for them, while companies who have low emissions get to save capital. To better show how allowances can be traded, we have created a brief PowerPoint presentation. Here we have two factories originally producing 20 tons of a certain pollutant. A cap and trade system is implemented, and a cap is set by the government at 7 tons per company. The government's goal for the year is to decrease emissions from 20 tons to 14 tons. In the first scenario, the two companies are able to decrease their emissions by 3 tons each. Each company was able to do so with no problem. There was no overly extensive effort or capital required. Both companies successfully remained below the determined cap. However, this scenario is ideal and might not always happen. Here in the second scenario, both companies have the same cap. However, the first company, the one in green, is able to decrease its emissions by four tons rather than three due to the ease and low cost of doing so. However, the second company, on the other hand, is not able to cut production below the cap. The first company still has one ton worth of credit which can be sold for the second company. The first company makes profit by selling it and is now rewarded for the further decreasing of their emissions. The second company receives the one ton allowance for the price that is lower than the fine. This scenario is more likely to happen with companies need to trade uh, to buy or trade their allowances. This concludes our brief diagram on cap and trade. A cap and trade system will have many aggressive effects. The price of gasoline will go up, which would result in an increase in prices in many sectors of the economy. Utilities and energy prices will go up as well. Thus, people will not accept it easily, especially not here in the United States, because they will just treat it as a tax. Companies will also oppose it because they would lose part of their revenue. Obviously, when big business is involved, political battles will occur. The implementation of a cap-and-trade system will face fierce resistance. The United States has actually implemented a cap-and-trade system to, do, to deal with sulfur dioxide, the leading cause of acid rain. This system was first put into place in 1995 and is mostly focused on coal-burning industries. Uh, phase two began in 2000, which was much more strict than the first one, and brought more specifics to companies and limited the allowances that were given out. For a cap and trade to be successful, the creators will need to focus on three main points of the system. Target setting, strategic allocation of allowances, and proper measurement and monitoring of the reduction system. Set targets are used in order to reduce emissions and to discover a value of a certain pollutant. An ideal target or cap would reduce as much emissions as possible while still allowing affected companies to remain competitive in their markets. For allocating allowances, the best option that is most fair and efficient must be chosen to ameliorate the cap-and-trade system. With this intricate of a system, establishing, operating, and evaluating the program will require a vast amount of data collection and analysis. A registry will need to be created to keep track, monitor, and verify both emissions and trading data. The cap-and-trade system is just one of the sub my bad. The European Union is made up of about 28 countries, and it has devised a plan to reduce the greenhouse gases that are being produced there. Their plan has three phases. It started in the 1990s, and they are currently on their third phase. This stage is much more strict than the previous two, which were trial periods to see if it was going to work. Uh, if they continue the way that they are going, they will be down by 21% by the year 2020, and they will be down by 43% in the year tw uh, 2030. The cap and trade system is just one of the solutions to curb climate change. The goal of the system is to reduce emissions greenhouses and to promote companies' innovative thinking and also to promote alternative energies. We all desire a sustainable world where everyone can live in happily. We might, not, we might disagree on how to achieve sustainability, but the end goal remains the same. A cap and trade system is just a solution with its own benefits and drawbacks. You decide if it's the right one for you and for the country.
The next two topics have to do with adding a greater supply of gas to the United States, hydraulic fracking and the Keystone Pipeline. Both of these debates are very controversial in recent years. Casey and Brandon are going to tell us about the pros and cons of these two issues. Brandon and I are here to inform you all on two hotly debated topics. Both of these public policies, hydrofracking and the Keystone Pipeline, have upsides as well as downsides. We're here to show you the main points and let you take your own stance on these issues. The first policy is the Keystone XL Pipeline. Six years ago, TransCanada, a multi-billion dollar corporation, filed an application with the United States government to build an extension on the already existing Keystone Pipeline. The system runs from Alberta, Canada to Illinois and Texas, as well as oil tank farms in Oklahoma. As of now, Canada provides over, around 2.5 million barrels of oil to the United States daily, 600,000 of those through the Keystone Pipeline. With the extension, the Keystone XL, 1,700 miles of the new system would provide 830,000 barrels of oil to the U.S. daily. As stated before, the oil comes from Alberta, Canada, which is home to the third largest oil refinery in the world behind Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. <coughs> oil sands production is expected to increase in that area from 1.9 million barrels a day in 2012 to 3.8 million barrels a day in 2022. With this increase in production, there will be more and more oil brought into the United States, which would be an increase in supply. When we see an increase in supply, we see a decrease in price at the pump. You may all think this is great, but in the long run, the United States becomes more dependent on oil rather than seeking other cleaner energy sources. That leads us into the main reason why people are fighting the Keystone Pipeline, the inevitable impacts it would have on the environment. What will be streaming through the pipeline is known as bitumen, which is a semi-solid petroleum product mixed with natural gas that's pressurized into a liquid. This would flow through six U.S. states, as well as many major bodies of water, including the Missouri River and the Yellowstone River. This will also cross the Ogala Aquifer. The Ogala provides drinking water to more than <coughs> two million Americans and agricultural water to more than a quarter of America's irrigated land. A spill or a leak would be catastrophic to the environment and the bodies of water and the communities that surround it. To show what would happen if the pipeline ruptured, we could look at many examples throughout history, two of which being the Enbridge Energy Pipeline rupture and the ExxonMobil Pe Pegasus burst. In 2010, Enbridge Energy Pipeline ruptured and released 843,000 gallons of oil into the Kalamazoo River in Michigan. Heavy rain caused the oil to be carried 35 miles downstream, and the cleanup still continues today. With ExxonMobil's Pegasus burst, 210,000 gallons were released into nearby communities. Thousands of residents had to be evacuated with headaches, nosebleeds, respiratory problems, and many health issues. These examples show what any spill or leak could do with a gas rupture. Now we can look at the upsides of the Keystone Pipeline. The major argument is that it creates jobs. In the two-year span, it would create 42,000 jobs, 15,000 coming with constructing and manufacturing the pipeline, 9,000 in building the pipeline, and 7,000 in forming the steel pipe. The rest would be through indirect ways, such as food service. The numbers increase significantly when looking to the year 2035. The Canada Research Institute puts that number at about 117,000 jobs created. The pipeline would also stimulate the economy greatly, adding $3.4 billion to it, as well as saving the United States $9.1 billion in crude oil costs per year. One major goal in recent years has been to make North America independent in terms of energy. This pipeline will have a huge impact on that goal and take reliance on other countries away from the United States. That is the Keystone Pipeline, and now we move to hydraulic fracking. Hydraulic fracturing in the United States began in 1949. According to the Department of Energy, as of 2013, at least 2 million oil and gas wells in the United States have been hydraulically fractured, and that of new wells being drilled, up to 95% are going to be hydraulically fractured. Hydro hydraulic fracturing has become a very popular topic, which started a controversy on whether or not it should be banned in the United States because of the health and environmental issues it can cause. Hydraulic fracturing is a process by which fractures and rocks below the Earth's surface are opened and widened 
widened by injecting liquids and chemicals at high pressures. Fracturing is used especially to extract natural gas and oil. Hydraulic fracturing is a step-by-step -step process. First, tanker trucks deliver water to the fracturing site. After the tanker truck arrives, a pumper truck injects a mixture of water, sand, and chemicals into the well. When the mixture is injected into the well, the shale, which is a fine-grained classic sedimentary rock composed of mud that is a mix of flakes of clay materials and tiny fragments of other materials, is fractured by the pressure inside the well, releasing natural gas and oil. After the natural gas and oil is withdrawn from the shale, the natural gas and oil flows out of the well. Then the natural gas and oil is stored and piped to the market. This public policy is a very big controversy because there are benefits as well as downsides. Hydraulic fracturing can be very beneficial to the United States because there's enough fossil fuel in the bedrock shell formation under North American soil to make the United States an independent nation when it comes to natural gas and oil, and in the future, an exporter for oil and gas. In December of 2012, the U.S. produced about 7 million barrels a day and imported 7.6 million. This shows an increase in 2008 when the U.S. only produced 5 million barrels a day. In, 2012, in 2013, 33% of gas consumed in the United States was imported from foreign countries. It is projected with the help of hydraulic fracking in 2035, this 33% will become 0%. Right now, we import gas from countries such as Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and Russia. Becoming an independent nation is huge because we won't have to rely on gas and oil from these foreign countries such as Russia, who use gas and oil as a political lever against us. Another benefit would be the increase of jobs. According to Midwest Energy News, hydraulic fracturing has already created 1.7 million jobs and is projected that in 2035, it would create about 3.5 million jobs. There are also downsides to hydraulic fracturing. One downside to hydraulic fracturing is that companies are not required by law to disclose the chemicals they use or the formula they use in the mixture in the fracking fluid. This is a very big issue because up to 600 chemicals are used in fracking fluid uh, including known carcinogens and toxins such as lead, uranium, mercury, ethanol glycol, radium, methanol, hydrochloric acid, and formaldehyde. This makes it very difficult for local residents or first responders to prepare for an accident or emergency and difficult for scientists to gauge the threat posed by these chemicals. Another big issue with hydraulic fracturing is that according to New York Times, only 30 to 50 percent of the fracking fluid is recovered which while the rest of the toxic is left in the ground, is not biodegradable. This can lead to the contamination in local drinking wells, which could harm or kill civilians. According to Nature World News, methane concentrations are 17 times higher in drinking water wells near fracturing sites than in normal wells. If you do the math, there are 500,000 wells that are hydraulic fractured in the United States. Each well can only be fractured 18 times. If each well needs 400 chemicals in order to be produced, that means that we're injecting 360 billion gallons of chemicals into the ground every time. If we go back to what New York Times said, and if 50% of fracking fluid is recovered, that means we're still leaving 180 billion gallons of chemicals into the ground. If you compare this to a swimming pool, which contains 20,000 gallons of water, that means we can fill 9 million swimming pools filled with these chemical material. And after all this, the recovered fracking fluid is left in open air pits to evaporate, leaving harmful vital organic compounds into the atmosphere, creating contaminated air, acid rain, and ground level ozone. Overall, these policies have their ups and downs, but is the risk really worth the reward? Just yesterday, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo released a statement saying New York will ban hydraulic fracking because the gas drilling method poses health risks. This means that right now, the only states that will prohibit uh, fracking is Vermont and New York. In conclusion, the United States and the other 48 states really need to figure out if these policies are really worth the health and environmental issue, uh, issues before anything escalates any further. Minimum wage is an ongoing issue among college students, fast food workers, and businesses. Tayo, Chelsea, Heather, and Danielle came in today to discuss with you why the minimum wage should be raised for economic, collective, and individual reasons. Welcome. So my name is Taya. I'm Chelsea. I'm Heather. And I'm Danielle. 
and I'm going to introduce you to why we think minimum wage should be increased. And we'll begin with a video. Work hard, make a home, earn a living, start a family, pursue happiness. That's the American dream. But for lots of people, no matter how hard they work, that dream seems out of reach. Rent, food, medicine, electricity, gas, childcare, college. There's always too much to pay for. Even though people have been working harder and harder, their wages are not keeping up. People are stretched, working two or even three jobs, juggling family responsibilities, doing everything they can to keep their heads above water. <sighs> All of that just to fall short every month. Is that what the American dream is all about? But what if we raise the minimum wage? That hard work will pay off. People would be able to make ends meet. They could quit their second jobs and spend more time with their families. And when that happens, whole communities are improved. Raising the minimum wage means millions of extra dollars in people's pockets. Families spend their money at Main Street businesses, strengthening our local economy. We've already seen this happening. The 13 states that raised their minimum wage in January of this year have added more jobs and have lowered unemployment rates than the 36 states that did not. Hardworking families deserve to thrive, not barely survive. Raise the minimum wage. It's good for families. It's good for business. It's good for our community. So to give some background information, in 1938, Franklin Roosevelt signed the Fair Labor Standard Act, which is a federal legislation that established the general minimum wage that must be paid to all covered workers. This act was meant to both protect workers, keep them out of poverty, and increase consumer purchasing power in order to stimulate the economy. The first minimum wage was set at 25 cents in 1938. The wage isn't tied to inflation, so it only goes up through congressional action. So over the years, the President and Congress have raised minimum wage 22 separate times, with the most recent increase being to its current rate of $7.25, which this number has not changed since 2009. Over the past 40 years, the value of minimum wage has decreased. For example, the federal minimum wage has reached its peak in 1968 when it was $1.60. If you translate that number to today's money, it will come out to equivalently $10.75. That is, in order for us to have the same purchasing power as we did in 1968, our minimum wage would need to be $10.75. To put into more perspective, in 1967, with just $1, people could get away with buying a sandwich, some fries, and even have leftover change to get some dessert. However, I can't do that today. Today, a sandwich at Burger King costs approximately $4.69. So as you can see, our dollar can't get us as much as it could before because the value of it has decreased. It takes more money for us to get the same things that we used to get for cheaper. To talk more about purchasing power, minimum wage purchasing power has not kept up since 1968. Minimum wage was supposed to help those that are receiving it maintain a minimum standard of living, as in one should be able to get by just enough with minimum wage so none working on minimum wage should be in poverty because the initial purpose of minimum wage was to get people out of poverty. There is also a concept called indexing with minimum wage. To index minimum wage means to adjust it automatically each year in order to keep up with the rising cost of living. Currently, there are 13 states, including Washington, Colorado, Florida, Vermont, and Nevada, who have taken it into their own hands to increase their own minimum wage above the federal minimum wage of $7.25 so that their workers don't lose much of their purchasing power each year. For example, throughout this year, 2014, these workers in these current 13 states saw their minimum wage automatically go up between 10 and 15 cents. And this has benefited over 2.5 million workers in the state minimum wage in the country. However, the remaining states and the federal government have not indexed their minimum wage. And as a result, with each passing year, the minimum wage value decreases. Raising the minimum wage at the federal level or in the remaining states will require an act of Congress. So, for the remainder of this presentation, I have three individuals who speak more about why minimum wage should be raised and how we'll hear about how increasing it will help businesses in the long term as it will help, as this will help them to grow the, as this will 
built to accommodate the increased salaries of their employees who will have more disposable income to spend, which will then return to businesses in a cycle of growth. We'll also hear how this will help individuals who work in businesses dealing with fast food restaurants, and most importantly, how this will help young adults who make up a big chunk of minimum wage workers. So I'll pass it along to Chelsea, who will speak more about the young adult minimum wage workers. So one important group of young adult minimum wage workers are college-age individuals. So currently, the number of unemployed graduates, according to the Economic Policy Institute, is nearly 10%, and the national student debt is over a trillion dollars. Increasing the minimum wage would combat these problems. So an increased minimum wage would mean an increased number of workers directly out of high school, because they would have the choice of college or employment, rather than feeling obligated to attend college. Everyone's seen those students who don't care about class, don't want to be there, and now they wouldn't have to be there, because degrees would become relatively obsolete. And this is because raising the minimum wage would, ac would afford an, a standard of living that would match the buying power, so that large purchases would be possible, such as cars, houses, or technology, and families would be possible as well. This would then create a trickle-down effect of money in the economy. Furthermore, by raising the minimum wage and having more workers in the workforce directly out of high school, there would be a decrease in the national student debt, because fewer people would be attending college and incurring debt. And that's the reason why anybody other than just college-age individuals should care. So, the decreased college enrollment would also mean less students attending, so lower prices. And therefore, those lower prices would be able to entice potential students. So as the supply for college goes up, or as the supply remains the same and the demand goes down, the number of students who are serious about college will increase in relation to the number of students who don't care. And therefore, colleges will no longer be money-making corporations, and the original purpose of education will return. This will eventually level the playing field, so like in the past, college will be affordable with a part-time job, and lower college prices will mean that price is no longer a limiting factor. So you may be saying, why will anybody go to college anymore? Well, college will still open the door to higher careers with better salaries for more ambitious people. However, currently, the minimum wage is not sufficient for this sort of thing, and students are often underemployed or unemployed completely despite their degrees, and they are forced to go into minimum wage jobs to try to pay off their student debt. And those jobs are often found in fast food or restaurant industries, which Heather will now talk about. The workers who are hit the hardest by minimum wage are restaurant and fast food workers. Restaurant and fast food workers are among some of the poorest people in America. And in this video, you will see some of those workers. Today, uh, I'm out here and standing in support with the minimum wage workers who are standing to let their voices be heard regarding their uh, low minimum wage pay that they're getting. And we're trying to get the uh, corporations to increase the wage to $15 an hour. We're dealing with a $200 billion industry and they're giving uh, their people peanuts. They're paying them minimum wage and they can't afford to live off minimum wage and support their families, pay their bills uh, to survive. Uh, they're not even giving them 40 hours a week. They're giving them approximately between 15 and 30 hours a week, which is entirely too low to try to survive us. They're living below poverty right now at this point. It would mean I would be able to move out of my parents' house like they want me to. The average wage in the restaurant industry is $10 an hour compared to $18 an hour, which is the average hourly wage outside the restaurant industry. Restaurant workers' hourly wages are 17.2% lower than that of similar work outside the restaurant industry. And this is known as the wage penalty of restaurant work, according to the Economic Policy Institute. The minimum wage for tipped workers is $2.13. Customers' tips are meant to make up the difference between that wage and the actual minimum wage. This means that customers are providing a subsidy to the employers that is more than double what the employers are paying their workers. The average age of a tipped worker is 25. At this age, many have to pay off college debts and pay for the basic living necessities, which they are unable to do with such a low wage. At that age, they are not able to start a life, pay off their bills, and some can't even move out of their parents' houses. This means they are not buying houses or apartments, and some aren't even buying cars. These wages are affecting more than just the restaurant industry, but also other industries, as they are losing potential customers. Tipped workers have a poverty rate of 12.8%, compared to 6.2% poverty rate of non-tipped workers. This means that a tipped worker is two times more likely to be in poverty than a non-tipped worker. 
46% of tipped workers have to rely on public benefits in order to support them and their family. These public benefits are not meant to be a permanent means of income or a business strategy to, in order to pay their workers low wages, but that is how it is used in the restaurant industry. Workers should not have to rely on these benefits because it does not only affect them, but also the government and taxpayers who provide these benefits to the people. In the restaurant industry, the highest paid employee, which is the manager's wage, is $15 an hour, which is still lower than the median wage outside the restaurant industry, which is $18 an hour. One in six, or 16.7% of restaurant workers, live below the poverty line. Researchers use the term twice the official poverty threshold for, work, for families who can't meet ends meet. Meeting ends meet means being able to afford the bare necessities or earning enough in order to provide the basics for their family. 43% of restaurant workers are below twice the poverty line compared to the 19.9% of people outside the restaurant industry who are twice below the poverty line. That is over double the rate of out outside the restaurant industry. Restaurant workers rarely receive any benefits as well. Only 14.4% of restaurant workers will receive health insurance compared to 49% of hourly wage workers outside the restaurant industry who receive health insurance. And only 8.4 are included in a pension plan compared to the 42% that are included outside the restaurant industry. These statistics are not good for anyone. In order to make it so that every worker in America can earn enough to support them and their family, things will need to be changed. The minimum wage will need to be raised and the tip minimum wage will need to be removed. Restaurant employees will need to allow paid sick days and just-in-time scheduling will need to be removed. Just-in-time scheduling means calling in employees with no prior notice or sending them home when business is slow. Without a steady livable income, these workers are forced to buy only the bare necessities if that. 13.1 million employees are in this industry and it is still growing. It is expected to increase by 9.8% by 2023. That would make it 14.4 million people who do not earn enough to make a living. That is 10% of the U.S. workers, which means 10% of U.S. workers are not able to support themselves. That is 10% of working people that can't contribute to the economy, that can't buy houses, cars, or other expenses. That is 10% that the government has to help support through the people's taxes. And Danielle will go into more depth about how the government is needed to assist the minimum wage workers. Okay, so when raising the minimum wage, individuals in their own lives are helped but also it affects the business side. Um, when the minimum wage is raised, it will raise the cost of business, which maybe prevent people from purchasing goods in the first place, but once the workers um, see their disposable income is increasing, they will be purchasing goods that they don't see as necessities in their lives. So in return, they will be reciprocating what the businesses are doing for them, so it's a win-win situation for both the employees and the employers. But with the minimum wage not being raised, the business world shows the necessity that it needs to be raised with a huge negative. Some of the managers of the largest corporations in the United States are telling their employees that they need to seek public assistance. Anyone earning less than $10.10, which is 20% um, of the bottom wage earners, receive public assistance in the form of seven primary means. Some of those include Medicaid, Earned Income Tax Credit, the Supplementary Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as Food Stamps, and the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. It is outrageous that this many people need government assistance because their jobs pay too little. If the government were to raise the minimum wage to 1010, which is less than a $3 raise, it would not only help the people, but it, was all, it would also help the government, and it was recently proposed in the Fair Minimum Wage Act of 2014. 1.7 million workers would not only need to rely on government assistance anymore, but it would also help the government because their spendings would decrease of approximately $7.6 billion per year, and that's just an, es an estimate. The excess money left over could go towards something more important, such as poverty needs or war funding. And this all leads to the rising inequality. With that being said, between 1979 and 2013, middle class workers' pay increased just 6.1%, which is 0.2% annually. And the workers in the top 95th percentile had an astounding increase of 40.6%, which is 1% annually. In more recent terms, in the end of 2013 and beginning of 2014, hourly wages fell for all earning groups except for the top 10th percentile. 
These differences being made between the upper and lower percentiles are just reasons adding to the rising inequality and excessive unemployment. To show a fun fact on minimum wage, um, compared to the years now and the, the years in around 1960 in inflation adjusted terms, the minimum wage workers today make 25% less than their equivalents then. So for an example, a full minimum wage worker with one child is has a paycheck made of so little that he or she will be left with a below the federal poverty line paycheck. With that being said, productivity is also growing in the industry today. Over the past 30 years, it has grown 64.9% and the workers' pay only grew 8%. Productivity at this rate is growing eight times faster than the workers' pay. Therefore, the government needs to raise the minimum wage and by doing so, it will not only positively affect the workers, but it will help the government in itself. With that being said, we conclude our report on minimum wage and hope you have learned the ins and outs of how minimum wage affects college students, workers, and businesses, and that is a necessity that it be raised. Wealth inequality in America is clearly prevalent, but what can we do about it? To start off, Nigel and Christian will give you a description of the past state of inequality and then move on to the present state of inequality in the United States. They will also discuss why you should care and a possible solution to this problem, which is higher tax rates on capital gains. America has seen um, several periods of economic inequality. The late 1800s are known as the Gilded Age. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. The late 1800s are known as the Gilded Age. Um, it's during this period that policies were aimed to make the rich richer and didn't focus on helping the middle class. Um, there was also little to no taxes on the rich. Um, people faced many of the same inequality problems uh, as they do today. This led to the stock market crash in the Great Depression of the late 1920s. Um, following that, um, around the late, uh, early 1940s was known as the Great Compression. This is a period of economic reform um, that sought to help develop the middle class. Uh, there was implementation of welfare and other policies. Um, during this period, uh, the income of the working class increased by 67%. Um, also during this time, there were progressive taxes put in place on the rich. Um, the tax rates for the wealthiest portion of Americans was 90% at this time. Um, so following that period is the post-war boom. This was after World War II. There was an increase of jobs. Also, um, workers' real wages rose 81% and income of the 1% rose 30%. So all economic, social classes, economic and social classes um, saw economic prosperity at this point. Following that was a period of stagflation. Um, working rate, workers' real wages and income of the top 1% both fell 3 and 4%. Um, so this brings us to the age that we're currently um, in, I guess, people refer to it as a new Gilded Age. Um, much like the Gilded Age, there's high levels of economic inequality. Um, it's all concentrated up at the 1%. Workers' real wages during this period fell 1%, while income of the top 1% rose 135%. Um, the richest 400 people make more wealth, have more wealth than the bottom 60% of Americans. Also, there's less progressive taxes when compared to the Great Compression. Um, the tax on the top wealthiest people in America is 40% when compared to 90%. Um, so on this graph, as you can see, there's little to no taxes on the, this, is, this graph shows um, tax rates on the wealthiest portion of Americans. So in early, 19, early 1900s, this is the Gilded Age, um, there's low tax rates. Over here is the um, stock market crash, and this is where we are today. As you can see, the levels are very near. Um, and then this is where we were doing good in America. This is economic prosperity and the Great Compression, as there are high taxes on individuals. So, why should we care? Ever since the Great Recession, the economy has been improving, right? We're all better off than we were 12 years ago, right? Wrong. The top 1% has had their salaries increase by 31.4% on average. That's 95% of the total economic growth in the country, leaving just 0.4% spread between the rest of us. That means most Americans are no better off than they were during the recession. So next is my, um, one of my favorite quotes, Everything in Moderation. It's uh, by Aristotle. How this applies? Well, too much inequality, just like too little, in a country like ours, leads to long-term growth hindering and our global competitiveness will decrease. As a final note, the as Christian mentioned, the levels of inequality currently were last seen right before the Great Depression. So, we have 
a two-part solution. The first part is more progressive taxation. Progressive taxes are taxes where the higher income groups are affected more than the lower income groups. For example, in this type of tax system, low incomes would be taxed 10%, middle incomes would be taxed 15%, and high incomes would be taxed 30% on their income taxes. M more progressive taxation will return the tax rates closer to that of the post-war boom where the economy was prospering. So the second part is capital gains. Capital gains are, as a definition, a profit from the sale of property or an investment. And as we all know, businesses have a lot to do with investments. So taxing capital gains, which currently have a maximum tax of 20%, will not only target the wealthiest, because as you can see in the chart, the wealthiest top 20% of the country own most of the capital gains. So it will not only target them, but it will also discourage them from using capital gains as a loophole in the tax system. So I hope you all recognize that this is a serious matter facing the nation and that something must be done lest we want another economic disaster on our hands. Next we will hear a discussion regarding immigration reform. Matt and Emily will be giving their uh, view on this issue. In case you're not up to date, President Obama recently addressed the country on immigration reform. Take a look. The tradition of welcoming immigrants from around the world has given us a tremendous advantage over other nations. It's kept us youthful, dynamic, and entrepreneurial. It has shaped our character as a people with limitless possibilities. People not trapped by our past, but able to remake ourselves as we choose. But today, our immigration system is broken, and everybody knows it. Families who enter our country the right way and play by the rules watch others flout the rules. Business owners who offer their workers good wages and benefits see the competition exploit undocumented immigrants by paying them far less. All of us take offense to anyone who reaps the rewards of living in America without taking on the responsibilities of living in America. All right, so we just watched a brief introduction to President Barack Obama's immigration reform bill. Now, he just gave a brief introduction, but if you were to continue watching it, you would find out that he talked about a couple main points which we will get more in depth in our presentation. They started off with the strengthening of borders, which would mean more government um, funding and increased spending. Deporting felons, um, not families, which are policies that we'll discuss further. And increasing the accountability of immigrants, as well as, I feel, the most important one, especially as far as Matt and I are concerned, the promotion of naturalization and easing the legalization process for immigrants. Yeah, so I definitely agree with you and uh, President Obama. and. <coughs> Uh, all of his points really, but mainly the legalization process. To make it easier would, from an economic standpoint at least, uh, be the most beneficial way to improve uh, immigration reform because it leads to monetary success. Uh, there's a stereotype out there that immigrants actually like take jobs over from Americans. However, this is not true. They improve the economy in various ways. Uh, from a recent study by the Hamilton Project, Quote, in many cases, an increase in unskilled foreign labor supply will create better opportunities for domestic workers. So this works because uh, immigrants are really a cheap source of labor. They take jobs such as construction, uh, like manual labor type things. So of course, they'll work for cheap, and the businesses are going to hire them because who wouldn't want to save money? Uh, these businesses will end up saving money and have the opportunity to expand. And by expand, I mean they'll create jobs for higher skilled positions, such as managers and stuff like that. Uh, those would be filled by domestic workers that have like, a little bit more experience in the area uh, of the field. So say construction, they might be a general contractor managing the immigrants. Uh, so this uh, growth in business will lead to an increase in GDP for the country. Uh, and it's very, the immigrants are very powerful in increasing GDP, in fact. Uh, hypothetically, if we were to uh, legalize and give amnesty to all undocumented immigrants in the country right now, uh, we would see a 5.4% increase in GDP throughout the next 20 years, which is actually $11.4 trillion. 
So it just goes to show you, even though we would never do this, uh, it goes to show you the economic power that these immigrants have. Um, now, continuing further with Matt's points, um, if we were to look into the demographics of the situation, um, here's a world map. Basically, there are 11.7 million undocumented workers that are currently residing in the U.S. Um, the interesting thing is that they are from places in Europe, the Middle East, Asia, South America, Central America. But the majority of them, which comes as no surprise, are from Mexico. And the majority, meaning 7 million undocumented workers. Now, what I found most interesting in President Barack Obama's address, and I believe that we also feel this way, is that we need to naturalize um, and make the citizenship uh, process much more easier for these workers. Um, President Barack Obama discussed easing legalization by implementing partial fee waivers and allowing credit cards to be used to pay for citizenship. He also discussed how, I mean, it's 11.7 million people, or if you were to look just at the fraction of Mexico being 7 million people, as a huge labor source. And we need to take advantage of it. Obviously, they already are aiding in our economy. So by doing so, he's implementing, or would like to implement, temporary working permits. And that would aid in the economic. Yeah. So uh, immigrants are really what make America unique. They can increase tourism. And they're some of our brightest minds. Uh, actually, 40% of all Fortune 500 companies were started by immigrants or children of immigrants into the United States. Companies like Apple, IBM, uh, Clorox, Home Depot, they were all started by immigrants. So they're really valuable to our economy. Um, also with the increased population comes uh, more taxpayers. And these people could help save Social Security with an increase in uh, the elderly population. We need more taxpayers to help uh, support them. Also to decrease the debt that we owe other countries, this would help as well. Um, so overall, you just see a, uh, an increase in America's economy by bringing more immigrants into the country. And I think going off of that, Matt, is it really raises the question as to why would we deport them in the first place if they're contributing so much to our economy already and they're undocumented. If we were to legalize them and make them as citizens, it would only benefit us as a whole. And I also, when you look into the facts, I mean, it's quite surprising and almost amazing that Every year, there's 290,000 immigrants who we have deported. And it's such a cost, not only on our government, because we're losing you know, these huge fractions of our labor sources, but um, it costs $23,000 per immigrant um, after the arrest, the legal fees, and everything. And that's costing our government um, over $6 billion a year. So it's extremely costly. And if you were to look at deportation on a moral level, um, which also, Barack Obama mentioned in his speech was, we are ripping families apart in essence because these parents are coming over with their children to better their lives, and in turn, 72,000 parents have been deported and their children are displaced, which is also creating another problem for our government. So in essence, I just don't understand the deportations, but it looks like if we were to do reform that there would be some efforts made in that way. And just to wrap up, Immigration is a huge part of America. It always has been. Uh, most of us here could really trace their roots back to immigration to the country. So to keep people out is almost against the country's uh, morals. And also, it would be a huge loss to our economy if we were to do that. Yeah, and I, coming off of that, wrapping it up, I strongly um, believe in the President's bill. I see that it offers many opportunities um, for making the legalization process easier for these people um, to the facts of the deportation. Um, what I found sort of most appalling as exactly was just the ripping of families. And you're definitely halting their dreams in you know sense of the, the American dream. So that's where I would feel with the immigration. With this next presentation, Julie and Joe hope to show how the consumption of soda is directly related to the obesity epidemic and its growing rate in today's society. They will also be discussing how an imposed tax will, impo will lower consumption and bring people to consume healthier lifestyles. My name is Joe. And my name is Julie. And we decided to do our presentation on a soda tax. And with this, over the past few decades, obesity has drastically risen and this can be directly linked to soda consumption. 
And with this being said, there needs to be a change in behavior in society. And this could be, um, this could be resulted by an imposed tax. And with this, the goal would be to higher the price of soda to lower consumption. And although this is not nationally recognized yet because nothing has been done um, due to people believing that this would impact the job market and weigh in on people's freedom, but in the end, we ultimately hope to see a change. Uh, I'm going to start uh, us off with a fun fact. Do you know that uh, Coca-Cola logo is recognized by 94% of the world's population? And it just, it's the second most understood term in the world, just behind OK. Do you know what that means? I don't. That means like when you go to Africa and you say, hi, what's your name? How are you? People don't understand, but you say Coca-Cola. They're like, oh, Coca-Cola. Like, instant bond right there. It's just amazing. And Coca-Cola is powerful, and soda is everywhere. <coughs> but that comes with obesity. And uh, Joe is going to show us a video. And with this video, what we hope to show you is that this was actually targeted toward people in New York. And with the goal is to show that soda consumption is very kind of nasty and is not good for your health. So over the past 40 years, obesity within adults has almost doubled from 15% to 30%. And when looking at children, their obesity rate has tripled from 5% to 15%. And that could be seen in the graph with the red denoting adults and the yellow children. Um, over the years, economists have found out that individual behavior is not rational. But lucky, luckily, it's very predictable. For example, how much we eat is affected by the size of the plate, the depth of the bowl, and how much the person with us is eating. So uh, they conducted an experiment. Uh, a group of people are given a bottomless bowl of soup. And uh, another group is given just a regular bowl. And when they compare the consumption of the bottomless bowl of soup people, they find out that their consumption is significantly higher. And that's one of the imperfections in our behavior. People don't know when they're full. And so that leaves us with the soda size. As you can see, Americans are drinking twice as much as Japanese. And this is because of the size. What do you expect American people to do? Like drink half of their drink and be as healthy as Japanese? No, they're not going to do that. So obesity here in America is much higher. And also adding to that, you could also see that in a lot of restaurants in the United States, mostly fast food, you can actually get free refills. So not only are you getting the 1,200 milliliter portion that, you're, um, that you ordered, you can actually put more soda into it. So like Julie said, it's like a bottomless bowl of soup. Yes. And when looking at the price of soda, it's actually dropped by over 34%. And now, this is, could be because it is market cheaper, but it allows for people to purchase the product at a lower price. And when looking at the cost of fruits and vegetables and other healthier alternatives, it's actually risen by 30%. So you have this gap because people are going to be purchasing these um, highly sugared drinks compared to the healthier alternative. $190 billion is a medical cost that stems from obesity-related health problems every year. That's almost 21% of the healthcare costs. And someone needs to pay for that money. Soda is directly linked to obesity. And as you can see in the back behind this guy holding the soda, you can see that he's drinking diet soda. Now, there's been a lot of controversy with that because diet soda has been linked to actually cause some types of cancer. And just because a company puts a label of diet on it does not mean that's a healthy alternative. Yep, don't believe the labels. And when we go to the supermarket, the first thing we see is like aisles and aisles of unhealthy food. 
as you can see in the picture, the soda aisle is, is conveniently placed next to the snack. That's like double the unhealthiness. And a way to kind of combat that and um, rearrange the aisles would be to probably put the healthier items at eye level so that you have the more fattening items out of the way and on the top shelf so that people, when they walk down these aisles, they're looking at these healthier alternatives rather than gazing at these fattening foods. And this next cartoon on the next slide um, shows one lady sitting at her desk who's um, indulging on these chocolates inside a bowl. And she asks her coworker, oh, how can you not resist this temptation? And her coworker simply states that because she put a distance between herself and her temptation. And this would kind of go back to rearranging aisles, that if you put a distance between yourself and all these fattening foods, then you won't eat them. It all comes out to self-control. But humans are famous for having a lack of control. So we need to impose a heavier policy. And we come up with a soda tax. Not only the soda tax curb obesity, it work will also raise revenue. And with this revenue, actually, what you can do is you could use this to maybe look into giving schools healthier school meals and campaigns against obesity. Imposing a tax on soda would lower consumption. And advocates of this uh, soda tax believe that soda is a new tobacco. And the tobacco strategy has definitely worked for the first time since the tax is imposed since decades. There has been a consumption decrease for the first time, substantial drop in consumption in both male and females. So we're hoping the same thing would go to soda. In this supply and demand graph, this shows the price of soda before and after a tax would be imposed. And the ultimate goal with raising the price of soda would be to be a decrease in consumption. And if there were a 10% increase in price, there would be an 8 to 12% decrease in consumption, which is the ultimate goal. And people bring up a bring controversy with switching to other alternatives that um, when soda is taxed that it's not the best option. Well, that is true. But then again, um, milk and other juices do provide um, more vitamins and more nutrients than soda. So although people will be switching to other products, it's still better than soda in the end. When I first go to the market here, I'm surprised to find out that the price of the soda bottle is almost like half the price of the water bottle. I mean, what went wrong? Water is so much like eat everywhere and very easy to produce. It's supposed to be like cheaper, right? And uh, soda, because this is so cheap, this is the reason why uh, the poor is drinking far more soda than the wealthy. And people are concerned that with this soda tax, the, it will be regressive, which means that the low-income people will hurt more than the healthier, the health, the wealthy. But actually, uh, the low-income people are more responsive to the price increases. So when the soda price suddenly goes up, people will drink less of it or stop it altogether. So the health benefits will actually be progressive. So we live in a country where we have a lot of freedom. And this comes down to um, people not believing that a tax should be imposed because we have individual choice and companies know that these products can be addictive so they kind of aren't um, for this tax so they believe that people should have their own choice and should be able to go to the supermarket and purchase their own drinks and whatever they want and this is kind of sad because it shows that they do not care about our health and ultimately this is just not a good step um. Coca-Cola and Pepsi are spending millions of dollars just to keep this tax from becoming a reality. One of their biggest arguments is that this is a job-killing tax. This is true. Uh, if the soda price suddenly goes up, people would curb their consumption, and a drop in consumption would cost the jobs of many workers. But uh, with the money they save on the soda, people are likely to go to buy more fruits, books, or movies, and these changes in demand will create jobs in other industries. So we should not worry about job market because it will resolve itself. Last month in uh, November, Berkeley actually went to the polls with this issue because they wanted to 
put up a tax on soda to combat um, childhood obesity, and it's actually passed with a 73% chance of people saying yes. So this was actually aimed at younger children, and what the goal of this is to actually make a domino effect. So the goal is to get the nation to actually recognize that this would impact society. And Julie and I both support this tax, and we believe that you should not enjoy obesity and enjoy your life. The legalization of recreational use of marijuana is quite controversial concerning people have so many different opinions about it. Today, however, you will hear why this legalization will be beneficial from here right in Rhode Island. You will be informed of medical facts, civil impacts on this, in, on this legalization, and also what we've seen from states that have already legalized it. And finally, what we can expect to happen in Rhode Island as a result of legalizing marijuana. Hello, I'm Jack Gerard. My group today is going to talk to you about the legalization of marijuana in Rhode Island. Um, it's our belief that this should be done. Um, as Molly outlined, we have various breakdown of the issue itself to kind of inform you on uh, all the very important aspects of it. And I'm going to start with health. And what I'd like to start with is kind of what marijuana does when it is consumed and how it works in the brain is where we're going to start. Um, now, what causes the human high is THC. And this THC is a cannabinoid, and it has been shown in studies that cannabinoids will bind very heavily to the front of the brain. Um, what this binding does is it will cause the human high, but then the other effects, as everybody kind of knows that has really ever been around this stuff or things like that, um, that you will have a decrease in cognition. Um, Short-term memory kind of becomes a little bit of an issue. Um, motor skills, it's very much like the depressive effects of alcohol. Um, but what is also very interesting is that in the back of the brain, um, the brainstem specifically, that controls a lot of your vitals, like your breathing rate and your heart rate, and things that kind of go on behind the scenes that you don't consciously think about, um, the uh, cannabinoids do not bind to that site at all, um, which really makes it very safe compared to other alternatives. Um, consuming very large amounts of cannabis will not decrease the brain function in the brainstem, which will prevent overdoses and death. Um, compared to alcohol, it's very easy to overconsume alcohol. And as you see, people will pass out. They might stop breathing, their heart rate slows down, and it can become a real issue. Um, alcohol is a legal and regulated substance. Cannabis is illegal. Um, more long-term effects. Um, particularly in the brain as well, keeping on that theme. Um, there's a study done in Dunedin, New Zealand with about a thousand people and it looked at adolescents, adults, and heavy use and obviously not so heavy use. And they followed these people for about 20, a 20-year 20 period. And what they found was all of them did have some decrease in IQ. There was a slight decrease. Um, as a whole though, what was very interesting and what I really got out of the study was that adolescent onset created a lot more problems than adult onset. In adult onset, um, depending on if your use was heavy or light, you usually had some sort of recovery if you um, um, terminated your use of cannabis for maybe about a year or so. In adolescent onset, this was not the case. A lot of times this recovery was not, was not seen and the damages were more significant. The um, highest IQ drop seen in that study was about eight points. Um, so if this drug is to be legalized, um, it should be regulated in a way very similar to tobacco and alcohol. It should be kept out of the hands of young people, um, whether that be 18 or 21, that should be determined by other brain studies and brain chemistry. Um, moving on to another long-term effect, especially associated with um, kind of tobacco and the pulmonary effects that marijuana would have. It was seen in this study that was conducted with 5,000 people between different sexes, races, ages, and it also followed them over a 20-year period, that there was no statistical significance in the effect of cannabis on lung function. Um, this essentially means that the data that they found, whether it be positive or negative, was more attributed to random, like a randomness or random factors, as opposed to being directly linked to marijuana. Um, the trends that they actually did find were very surprising. Um, one of them actually suggested that those that smoked marijuana on a level that was not overconsumption was actually better than those that didn't, I guess, due to the um, the breathing techniques that a lot of smokers use would increase their lung volume, which is one of the um, stats they use to measure overall lung function. Um, but as a whole, yeah, there was no statistical significance in the data. So it was not determined whether it was bad or good, but there was definitely no, nothing saying that it was 
um, harmful. Um, compare this to tobacco, there are many, many known negatives, um, tar in the lungs, lung cancer, um, and then you can reach outside that to just uh, heart disease, hypertension, and this is a legal and regulated substance, um, which, you know, obviously cannabis is illegal, so it's a little odd. To wrap the whole thing up, um, from the research that I've done, it is very apparent to me that between alcohol, tobacco, and other legal substances, marijuana is actually your safest bet. <laughs> like, if you were to have to pick one to do on a um, pure health standpoint of danger, marijuana would be the one that you would pick to do the least amount of damage. Um, through proper regulation, education, and moderation, of the, and, um, moderation in terms of use of the substance, you can mitigate a lot of the negative effects that cannabis has um, on the population. Um, so from a health standpoint, it is my personal opinion that there really is no logical reason based on today's standards for legal drugs that this should be an, an illegal substance. And I'm going to hand it off to Harry, who is going to go over civil impacts. So in order to further understand the reasoning behind legalizing recreational cannabis, one must further understand the logical reasons behind it. And these draw on extensive studies and clear scientific research and data that concern medical usage and properties, prison statistics, health risks compared to alcohol and tobacco, and adolescent usage. In terms of medical effects, as Jack pointed out, there are no real long-term harmful effects of marijuana on an adult brain. And along with that, the many medicinal properties and usages of marijuana have become common knowledge in both pop culture as well as in the medical field. And these include being used to cure and treat things from nausea to chronic pain, vomiting, anorexia, anxiety, epilepsy, glaucoma, and many other ailments and diseases. Despite this, it remains illegal and classified as a Schedule I drug by the DEA, which states it has no recognized medical effect in the United States. As a result of this, anyone that chooses to consume marijuana is considered a criminal and faces steep fines and even jail time. According to a congressional report, the prison population in the United States has gone up 790% since 1980 and is very near reaching overcrowding. And the Federal Bureau of Prisons shows that marijuana offenses account for almost 15% of all prisoners in the United States. What this means is that if marijuana were legalized, it would remove a significant population of potential prisoners and eliminate this overcrowding and also free up large amounts of government spending that could go towards things like education reform, infrastructure, and even the regulation of marijuana as opposed to being used to pay to keep prisoners in jail. And aside from these practical reasons alone, it seems entirely illogical to continue to criminalize a substance that has been proven far less dangerous than both alcohol and tobacco. As Jack pointed out, it's common knowledge that of the harmful effects of alcohol and tobacco. For alcohol, these include alcoholism, ulcers, potential for liver cancer, potential for alcohol poisoning. And with cigarettes, we all know of the many harmful chemicals involved, the potential for lung cancer, potential for addiction, etc. And this is opposed to cannabis, which has many known health benefits, and it's been proven to be far less dangerous than both alcohol and tobacco. And yet, it still remains illegal while these go on legal and regulated. One of the arguments for this is that if legalized, marijuana could lead to a higher potential for adolescent use and abuse. But to counter this, one need only look at alcohol and tobacco in the United States. These two substances have the same potential for use and abuse by children, but children across the country continually report that it's harder to acquire alcohol and tobacco than it is to acquire marijuana, despite marijuana being legal. This is because bars and convenience stores, anywhere that sells alcohol and tobacco, face steep legal fines. They could lose their business and they could even go to jail if they supply to minors. Robert McCoon from University of California, Berkeley, has long studied the Netherlands, a country that has legalized cannabis a long time ago, and he has found that teens there continually report that it is harder to get marijuana than it is for American teens to get marijuana. And this is in a country with legal recreational cannabis. And again, if it were legalized in America, dispensary owners and anyone that could provide cannabis would face closing of their business, bankruptcy, and even jail time if they supplied to minors. To conclude, this research and data provides reason enough to legalize marijuana. And in the states that have already done it, their contenders are being proven wrong across the board. And for this information, I will send it over to Ian. OK. So we need to realize that we are not reinventing the wheel here. We can look at states that have already legalized marijuana um, to get info on how it may affect the economy of Rhode Island. Um, 
So the states that have legalized marijuana for recreational use are um, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. I'm going to focus on uh, Colorado and uh, Washington um, because they were the first and, uh, and Oregon and Alaska just, just recently passed um, the bill to legalize marijuana so that it's too soon to tell um, how it'll affect their economy. Um, So in Colorado, at first, uh, the benefits that um, were quite apparent were uh, high tax revenues, um, new jobs were created, uh, they saved money on law enforcement, and uh, crime rates went down. Uh, at first, the price for one ounce of marijuana in Colorado was anywhere from $100 an ounce to $500 an ounce which surprisingly did not deter customers from buying. They were lined up outside of dispensaries ready to purchase. And uh, Colorado also received a lot of out-of-state customers as well. Colorado is expecting to receive uh, $1 billion in marijuana sales, which correlates to $134 million in tax revenue. To put this into perspective, to, to put this into perspective, um, that would pay for the new engineering quad here at URI. <coughs> the money that they're going to receive from the tax revenue, they have decided to uh, put towards the public school system, infrastructure, and youth education programs on uh, marijuana abuse to educate um, the youth on um, the effects that um, Jack mentioned earlier. Colorado has also seen uh, a drop in crime rates, um, particularly in uh, violent crimes. Uh, and the state has also saved money on law enforcement. Instead of um, having to spend time and money going out and um, giving people fines for possession of marijuana, they can now spend their resources and their time uh, more efficiently on preventing um, more serious crimes. Washington uh, took more of a restrictive um, path for legalizing marijuana. They limited the license, number of licenses to sell, um, which is different from in Colorado where um, any dispensary can open up and uh, would be able to sell. In Washington, um, they also banned the growth of uh, plants for personal use um, at residence, um, residencies. And uh, they also restricted the advertisement uh, of marijuana, which is good. It'll keep it um, from uh, youth exposure. Uh, and um, hopefully keep it from getting into the hands of um, adolescents. Um, despite uh, the restrictions and um, the more restrictive nature of Washington, um, they still are expecting $43 million in tax revenues uh, next year. And by 2019, they're expecting uh, $694 million in tax revenues. So overall, we've seen nothing but um, benefits to both Colorado and Washington. And to talk about Rhode Island, I'm going to pass it over to Rashul. Thanks, Ian. Um, now that we've seen the uh, health impacts, the civil impacts, and we've looked at the other states that have legalized the recreational use of marijuana, I'd like to focus on Rhode Island and its potentials for its economy. I want to start with the um, unemployment rate. At the end of the recession, it was at 8.2%, and currently it's still above 8%. So there's improvement, but there's not much, and more improvement's always better. So if the recreational use of marijuana is legalized, dispensaries will open up, distributors will come into business, and that'll create more jobs because those people need workers. And uh, that'll create more money flow, and there's a positive outcome for the job market there. There's also potential in gaining tax revenues. Um, recently, I read an article that says in Rhode Island there are less children being born than there were in the last decade, 
and more children are being born into poverty. Open Door <coughs> does a policy report and it estimates the effect of uh, taxes. It predicted between 21.5 to 82 million dollars in the first year for tax revenues. That money is a huge amount for Rhode Island and it can really be used. It can be used towards the poverty, towards educational reforms, um, building bridges, and other areas in the state that need the money. Moreover, we can save money on drug enforcement laws. Currently in Rhode Island, uh, marijuana is decriminalized, which means if you have more than an ounce of marijuana in your possession, you can go into jail for over six months or get a very heavy fine. Forty-three percent of the drug-related crimes in Rhode Island are related to marijuana. And it costs about $20,000 to keep one inmate in prison for up to a year. That's a huge amount of money. If you go into prison for, say, six months for having over an ounce of marijuana, that's $10,000. And if there's many arrests, which 43%, as I mentioned before, that's a lot of money that Rhode Island would save if it's legalized. Not only that, in the entire Northeast, there's no other state that's legalized this drug for the recreational use. If Rhode Island is going to legalize it, they should do it very soon because it'll get out of state buyers. We know that because we've seen it in Colorado and Washington, and it will happen in Rhode Island too. So by looking at the health impacts, the civil impacts, and what we've seen in other states, Rhode Island should definitely legalize the recreational use of marijuana. Thank you.